Well, good morning. We're continuing on in our uh, series in Luke this morning, and as has already been hinted, we're going to be looking at Luke chapter 4, and the section we're looking at is verses 14 through to 30. So if you have your Bibles, I'd ask you to open up to that. Um, We've already had a portion of that read for us this morning, but I'm going to go through and, and read the entire section. Uh, Today we're going to be looking at how Jesus is presented as the rejected prophet. And we're going to look at three movements that happen in this section. The first is how Jesus is led in ministry. Second is what this ministry is that Jesus came to achieve and accomplish. And then finally, how did the people respond to Jesus' ministry? So we'll begin by reading Luke chapter 4, verses 14 through to 30. Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread throughout the whole countryside. He was teaching in their synagogues, and everyone praised him. He went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath day he went into the synagogue, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom from the prisoner and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. He began by saying to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his lips. Isn't this Joseph's son? They asked. Jesus said to them, Surely you will quote this proverb to me, Physician, heal yourself. And you will tell me, Do here in your hometown what you have heard you've done in Capernaum. Truly I tell you, he continued, No prophet is accepted in his hometown. I assure you that there were many widows in Israel in Elijah's time when the sky was shut for three and a half years and there was a severe famine throughout the land. Yet Elijah was not sent to any of them but to a widow in Zarephath in the region of Sidon. And there were many in Israel with leprosy in the time of Elisha the prophet, yet none of them were cleansed, only Naaman the Syrian. All the people in the synagogue were furious when they heard this. They got up, drove him out of the town, and took him to the brow of the hill on which the town was built in order to throw him off the cliff. But he walked right through the crowd and went on his way. In the first part of today's passage, we read of Jesus being empowered by the Holy Spirit to return to Galilee. Just previous to this passage in Luke is recorded uh, Jesus' temptation in the wilderness where he was uh, in the wilderness for 40 days and tempted by the devil. And in Luke chapter 4 verse 1, we see that Jesus was led and full of the Spirit when he went into the wilderness where he was tempted. Now in verse 14, we again see that Jesus is being empowered by the Spirit as he follows its leading back to Galilee. Here at the very beginning of Jesus' ministry, Luke is making it clear that Jesus' ministry is both guided and empowered by the work of the Holy Spirit. Jesus is a perfect example for us in this. Rather than depending on his own strength and his own plans, he rather depends on the Holy Spirit who leads him in the ministry that he has been sent to accomplish. As Christians, we are to follow Jesus' model by also looking to be led by the Holy Spirit and to find our strength in Him rather than in ourselves. As feeble humans, it's so easy for us to follow the desires of our own sinful hearts and look to do what is most convenient and most pleasant for ourselves. But we're not called to fulfill our own plans for our lives, but the mission that God has called us to. In this, we are to be sensitive to how the Holy Spirit leads us and to rely on the power that he gives us to do the ministry that he has called us to rather than depending on our own skills and our own experiences. So very early on in this passage, we already have our first point, which answers the question, how did Jesus do his ministry? 
and that is that Jesus is led and empowered by the Holy Spirit for ministry, and so too are we to be led and empowered by the Holy Spirit. After this, verse 14 mentions about the news about Jesus and how this has already been spreading amongst the people. Even here, again, at the very, very beginning of Jesus' ministry, people are already hearing about him, and they're anticipating what he is going to do. In verse 15, it mentions that while Jesus was teaching in the synagogues, the people would praise him for his teachings that he would give. Verse 16 then mentions that Jesus went to Nazareth and that this was the place that he was brought up. This will become very important for us later on. And so Luke is here reminding and preparing his readers that Jesus is returning to his hometown and he is going to preach in the synagogue there on the Sabbath day. Now, the services that they had in the synagogues did not really look all too different from what our services look like today. They would recite scripture together, they would pray together, and they would have someone read large portions of what we know today as the Old Testament, but of course for them would have been their entire scriptures. Then, after someone would do the reading, uh, they would read from two different sections of the Bible, there would then be someone who would stand up and give a sermon on the passages that were read, and the service would then close with a benediction. In this passage, then, it's likely that Jesus is the one giving the sermon rather than the one reading scripture. And so with this in mind, when Jesus is handed the scroll of the prophet Isaiah, it's quite possible that large portions of Isaiah were read ahead of time before Jesus actually stood up. So when Jesus stands up, and in Luke 4, 18 and 19, it records him reciting a few lines from the book of Isaiah. In your Bibles, you will have uh, a footnote after these verses that are quoted by Jesus, and it will mention that these verses are taken from Isaiah 61, verses 1 and 2, and then also from Isaiah 58, verse 6. Since Jesus is recorded here as quoting from two different chapters of Isaiah, it's possible that he's taking verses from a huge chunk that would have been read just ahead of time, and now he is uh, summarizing the teaching that has been given there. So Jesus gets up, he's handed the scroll of Isaiah, and he summarizes some key thoughts from Isaiah uh, chapters 58 through to 61. And then in Luke 14, verses 20 to 21, it records him rolling the scroll back up and then telling everyone that the passage that has just been read has been fulfilled among them. By saying this, Jesus is making it clear that the person who is speaking in this passage of Isaiah is actually Jesus himself. In order to understand this, we have to understand what is going on in the passage that's been quoted from Isaiah. Here, we have the words of a prophet who has been anointed by the Spirit to proclaim good news. As we mentioned earlier, Luke 4 makes it clear that Jesus is both guided and empowered by the Spirit, and this passage of Isaiah states that the prophet speaking is also guided by the Spirit. In this way, Jesus is the prophet that is prophesied of. He too is anointed with the Spirit and is guided to proclaim the good news. The prophet's role is to proclaim good news to the poor, freedom for the prisoners, sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. But not only is Jesus' role to proclaim this good news, he is also to bring it about. But what does this good news actually look like? What does it mean to bring good news to the poor, to set prisoners free, and to give sight to the blind? In 2005, something really excited, exciting happened in my life. Why I was so excited about this, looking back, I'm really not sure, but I was. One day, with my mom and my dad, we drove to the big city of Orangeville, and we went to a car dealership and purchased a new car, a 2005 Kia Spectra. 
That's, that's not our car, but that's a picture of a Kia Spectra. I was ecstatic to get this new car. Again, I'm not sure why. Maybe it was the closest thing to a sports car I'd ever seen. Um, but this was the car that I would later learn how to drive with. Later on, after I got my G2, I would be able to even drive it on my own. And uh, throughout the years, I got to build some pretty great memories with this Kia Spectra. In 2017, uh, this car had seen a good deal of mileage. It had been div- driven across the state several times through many snowstorms, and it had accumulated its fair deal of rust. And at this point in time, we knew it was on its last legs, and uh, Laura and I were living in Kitchener, and so my parents had gifted this, uh, this Kia to Laura and I to drive as it uh, was slowly, slowly dying. In the months leading up to its final death, we were alerted of many, many problems in this car. One was that the hood, uh, the latch for the hood, had rusted away completely. And so you couldn't actually pop the hood with the lever anymore. You needed to get pliers to get this little wire, and you pulled it, and then the hood would pop. The other thing that happened is that the lever to pop the lid to the gas tank was also broken. And so I figured out that if I had a screwdriver, I could pry it open and pop it so I could fill out the gas tank. Which, very conveniently, I was the only one who knew how to do, so I was always the one filling out the gas tank. Um, And just generally speaking, whenever we drove this car, there was so many noises that we did our best to ignore them. And so Laura actually found this meme during this time, and we we believe it describes very well what was going on for us. (laughs) But there was one more problem that this car had, and it's my personal favorite. The back left tire had a very, very slow leak in it didn't deflate quickly. Uh, It wasn't, you know, a day or two, but instead it would slowly deflate over a period of about two or three weeks. And at this time, we didn't have an air compressor or anything, so instead we had a bicycle pump that was about this big. (laughs) And so I kept the bicycle pump in our back seat, and I would just kind of monitor the tire, and then every two to three weeks, I would pump the tire back up again. And uh, it was great. It worked fine. Um, And Laura, when I mentioned this to Laura, she also reminded me that not only did I pump it up, but sometimes I asked other people to pump it up for us, too. And uh, her one favorite memory was one day when we were here for a youth event, and uh, I had to get some stuff ready in the church, and there was a couple of youth standing around, so I asked them to pump up the tires. And uh, one of them was Sue Young, but I don't see Sue Young here, which is too bad. But the way she pumped up the tire was the most methodical way I've ever seen, also the slowest, but she did a great job. And uh, when she was pumping it up, there was actually a big trucker, there was a big truck that was driving by, saw her pumping it up, and brought the truck into the church parking lot and used his air compressor to pump up our tires for us. So we have a lot of fun memories of, uh, of pumping up this tire, uh, but eventually the Kia did, did die and it got towed away. Now, of course, when I tell this story, it's obvious that the real problem with the back tire was not simply that it lost air. The sh- issue that was to be addressed was why it lost air. All I knew was that answering the question why was going to cost money, and so instead of dealing with the real problem, I did a temporary fix by consistently pumping up the tire. But this didn't actually solve the problem. It just covered it up until I would have to pump it up again. When some people look at passages like the one that we're going through today, they believe that Jesus' ministry was to come and pump up tires. They believe that Jesus has come to help poor people by giving them jobs, food, and a place to stay. They believe that Jesus came to set prisoners free from the societies and corporations that bind them. And they believe that Jesus came to take away physical illness. But if that is all that Jesus came to do, then he simply came to pump up tires that were only going to deflate later on. What Jesus actually came to do is save those who are poor in spirit to save those who are aware of their sinfulness and depravity and realize that there is nothing that they can do to reconcile their relationship with God. He came to set captives free from the kingdom and dominion of Satan who keeps people bound in their sin and guilt. 
And he came to heal people of their spiritual death, which can only be revived by the grace of Jesus Christ. Jesus did not come to do patchwork, but to bring transformation and change. To help us think of this, we can use the categories of sin and sins. Sins are the things that we commit. We act in anger, we act out in jealousy, we hurt others, we make idols. These are the things that we do that are wrong, and they justly leave, uh, lead us to being in deserving of punishment before God. But sin is the problem of the heart. As humans, all of us are born sinful and depraved. Our desires from birth are to do what is contrary to God. And it is because of this sin, which started with Adam, that societies are corrupted, that people are poor, and that people die from illnesses. We can try and deal with the sins by acting like morally better people, by trying to change society, by trying to bring physical healing. But unless sin is first dealt with, the sins will always reappear. Sin is the heart of the problem. And unless it is defeated, then nothing else will ultimately bring change. So Jesus' mission is to come and provide forgiveness of sins, but it is also to come and provide a new way for people to be made new. In Jesus' life, he achieves for us righteousness. In his crucifixion, our sins are paid for. In his death and burial, our sinful hearts die with him, and then in the resurrection, we are given new hearts and a new life. As people who have been given new hearts, we can then look to bring transformation from the sins that we see around us. But when we only deal with the sins and not with the heart of sin, we will only be pumping up tires. So what then is Jesus' mission? Jesus, the prophet, has come to give new life to the poor in spirit, to free people from the bondage to sin and slavery, to heal people from death, and to usher in the favor of the Lord. Those who accept this message of Jesus and follow him receive the spiritual healing and forgiveness that they need, and they can then participate in Jesus' mission by proclaiming the good news to sinners. And as people are given new hearts and are transformed to new lives, then we can begin to help the people who are poor, to help those who are sick, and to help the society be healed from its wickedness. But this process must always start with the heart, for true change of action can only come as a result from inward transformation. And this brings us to our second point, that Jesus' ministry is to heal people from their sin so that they can live new lives and seek justice and restoration. This leads to the final question. How is it that people will respond to the ministry of Jesus? With the ministry of Jesus as prophet being announced, the congregation in Luke 4 verse 22 are initially amazed. However, they immediately ask, isn't this Joseph's son? The interest that they had over the initial teaching of Jesus is immediately questioned as they realize that this is just some kid from their hometown. They know all about his birth and his upbringing, and now here he is telling them that he is the foretold prophet and Messiah. The people in the synagogue are expecting someone royal, someone majestic, and instead they're presented with this kid that they've seen grow up in their own streets. The people figure that his teaching is fine, but now to claim that he is the one who he says he is, to them that goes too far. Jesus hears this grumbling, and he immediately retorts in verse 23 that the people essentially want Jesus to practice what he preaches. If he really is to bring about healing, then why doesn't he prove it to them? Further, they've heard that he's brought healing elsewhere. Why, don't they, why doesn't he do it there? In verse 24, Jesus mentions that no prophet is accepted in his hometown. And he then proceeds in verses 25 to, through to 27 to give two examples from the Old Testament of prophets who, like Jesus, were also rejected. First, in verses 25 through to 26, he mentions of Elijah, who was run out of Israel and instead went to a woman in the region of Sidon. 
Then verse 27 mentions of Elisha who was sent to heal Naaman the Syrian. In both of these cases, Elijah and Elisha were rejected by their own people, the Israelites, and instead turned to bring healing to the Gentiles, those outside of Israel. Now here's Jesus telling a group of Israelites that they too are disowning their own prophet. And Jesus, like Elijah and Elisha, will leave the group that rejects them and will provide healing to the Gentiles who accept them. The passage closes with the people in the synagogue responding in complete rage. They look to take him to a cliff and kill him, but Jesus gets away from the crowd. Uh, The details of how this happens is unclear, whether Jesus just snuck his way through and was unharmed, or whether this was something miraculous that happened, we don't know. But what we do know is that at this point in time, Jesus' time had not yet come to die. But this is also prophetic of Jesus' later crucifixion, when the crowd again will charge against him and seek that he is killed. There are three points that I want to make based on this last section. The first is that many are happy to accept Jesus as a great teacher, but not as the foretold prophet and Messiah. When I go to Toronto for school uh, a couple days a week, I'm often very interested to see all the different bulletin boards that are in the schools and, and throughout the area of where my classes are. And the other week, I saw one poster advertising event that uh, really stood out to me. And as I was preparing for the sermon, it came back to me. And it had a poster, and it had this description. It says, What do Hebrew, Christian, and Muslim scriptures tell us about being a good person? Meet friends from all faith traditions and read sacred texts together over free pizza. No faith? No problem. Come as your whole self. I thought that this poster perfectly illustrated the reality of this point. It is quite acceptable for people to come to the Bible as a historical document, or very, at the very least a literary document, and read about how Jesus was a great moral teacher. The problem arises is when people are called to deny themselves, to confess that they're broken sinners, and to claim Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. People in the synagogue were okay to accept Jesus as a captivating leader and teacher, but once he claimed to be the prophet and Messiah, he had overstepped his bounds. People are no different today. The question that's presented to us is how are we going to see Jesus? Are we willing to accept him as the prophet and Messiah that he claims to be? For the Nazarites, the answer was no. And this leads to the second point. So while some people accept Jesus' message, others will reject it. A couple of years ago, I was invited to go to an event that was being put on by a new ministry in uh, Kitchener-Waterloo. And it was an event that um, basically worked towards youth outreach. And so uh, I was invited to the event, and I decided that I would go, and I brought Grace and Laura along with me, and we arrived at the event, and very quickly we realized we were underdressed. And uh, we kind of felt like Will Smith, and everyone else looked like uh, his aunt aunt and uncle. Um, We were the only ones not wearing suits, and not only were we not wearing suits, we were wearing uh, jeans and hoodies. Um, So we looked very out of place, but that uh, didn't bother us too much, because there was a lot of really nice food there that was given for free. So we made sure to eat the appetizers, even though we couldn't pronounce them. And after a little while of sitting around, we were all ushered in to uh, a common meeting place. And in this meeting place, there was information that was being given about what this ministry was all about. And then there was also people that shared testimonies about how this uh, ministry was great, how it had an impact and whatnot. And there uh, there was one testimony in particular that stood out very clearly to me. The man shared about the ministry and the power of sharing the gospel. And then to support his point, he cited 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 14 to 15. But thanks be to God, who always leads us captives in Christ's triumphal possession and uses us to spread the aroma of the knowledge of him everywhere. 
For we are to God the pleasing aroma of Christ among those who are being saved and those who are perishing. He read these verses and then continued on speaking about how the gospel changes lives and how this pleasing aroma needs to be shared to all. Now, in one of my not-so-finer moments in life, I let out a subtle uh, but clear to my wife laugh after he read this verse. Immediately, I saw myself as Laura quickly gave me a jab to the gut and looked at me with her piercing gaze. But I think she knew what was going on. Um, I am thankful that she did this, by the way, and my outburst was intentional. But his choice of verses bothered me. Does anyone know why? Well, the very next verse follows. To the one, we are an aroma that brings death. To the other, an aroma that brings life. Or, to put it as the NLT does, to those who are perishing, we are a dreadful smell of death and doom. But to those who are being saved, we are life-giving perfume. I was annoyed that he omitted this verse as I feel it is so typical of the way that many contemporary Christians speak. We love talking about how the gospel saves and brings new life, but we avoid at all costs the reality that to those who reject it, it is an awful call of death and eternal condemnation. The passage that we looked at today in Luke is a clear showing of how Jesus' ministry was not accepted by all people. There were many, and there continues to be many, who reject the gospel of Jesus Christ. It was not because Jesus wasn't a good speaker or teacher. In fact, he was very, very gifted in this way. It was simply because of their sinful and hard hearts that they rejected Jesus and his message, and to them, the gospel is not good news. As we think about what faithful ministry looks like today, we often talk about growth in numbers, growth in giving, how many people become baptized, how many become members, how many go to this or that event. But perhaps to add to this list, we should ask how many people have rejected the message that we proclaim. If a church never causes any unrest, never leads to any people being uncomfortable or even rejecting the teaching, then maybe we should ask if we are teaching the same message that Jesus did. If people rejected the message of Jesus when he taught it, then we should likewise expect that some will continue to reject it today. The third and final point from this section is that people will not only reject the ministry of Jesus, but people will also reject those who follow him. After the famous line in John 15, 17, this is my commandment, love each other, comes a passage of Jesus that is less frequently quoted. If the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. If you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. As we identify with Jesus Christ and his uh, message, as we proclaim it and look to live lives in accordance to it, people will reject us as they rejected Jesus. But we do not have to be dismayed. For the same Holy Spirit who guided and empowered Jesus in order to fulfill his ministry will likewise guide and empower us in order to live out the lives that he has called us to. We are sinful and inadequate people who are incapable of living for Christ and are incapable of receiving rejection. But through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, we can be transformed to live our lives for Christ and to withstand whatever it is that he will lead us through. And moreover, not only has Jesus sent his Holy Spirit to lead us and empower us, but in Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, he has assured us of his eventual return to fully establish his kingdom. At that time, all wrongs will be set right. There'll be no more evil, no more poverty, sickness, no more death, no more persecution or rejection. At that time, Jesus will be Lord over all, and his followers will be freed from the plagues of this life and will be ushered into eternity with him. That is where we place our hope, knowing that Jesus has defeated the grave in this world, and one day he will return to set all things right. Let's pray. Dear God, we thank you for the life and work of your son, Jesus Christ. 
We thank you that through him, we can be indwelled by the Holy Spirit, and we can be guided and empowered for ministry. We also thank you that through Jesus Christ, we can be forgiven of our sins, given a new heart, and can enter into your son's kingdom and live our lives for him. God, we also recognize that as we present the good news of your son, Jesus, there will be some who accept it and others who reject it. As a church, we pray that you would empower us to be faithful, to preach the gospel, despite the difficulties it may bring, and despite how countercultural it may seem. We pray that we will first and foremost be faithful to you and your word above all else. Equip us, we pray, to do the work that you have called us to, to be firm in the face of difficulties and rejection, and to live in eager expectation of your son's second coming. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.